Throughout their history, the Lakers have had a long line of dominating big men. George Mikan, Wilt Chamberlain, and Shaquille O'Neal overpowered opponents with size and strength. But Kareem Abdul-Jabbar ruled the middle in a different way, using agility and finesse. Kareem was a true giant of the game, and he's featured this week on Vintage NBA. Basketball has changed. It's always been a great game, but now it has a new spirit. He dunks like Dr. J. He might be the new ice man. The modern day, Will Chamberlain. He looked like Magic Johnson. The future has arrived. You are watching what greatness is all about. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Vintage NBA. I'm Robin Roberts. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar set a standard of excellence that is unmatched in NBA history. And over the next hour, we'll look back at his incredible career. Abdul-Jabbar had perhaps the game's most devastating weapon, the skyhook, and he used it to become the NBA's all-time leading scorer. During his last two seasons, Kareem's Lakers faced the Pistons in the finals, and watching was a young fan in Detroit who grew up to become an NBA All-Star. He's Chris Webber of the Sacramento Kings, and this week, Chris is in the chair. The captain, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, number 33, skyhook goggles and low-top sneaks. <laughs> I think that uh, every team needs an anchor, and I think on that team he was their anchor. It wasn't showtime of 30 seconds of going to tie a game. They're slowing the ball up and throwing it right into Kareem. The ball goes into Kareem at four. I don't think Kareem knows it. Three, now he knows it. A 15 footer, good! It's into Kareem. Kareem swing left, right hand, 12 footer, good! He was just the stabilizer and the foundation of their whole franchise and dynasty. Kareem was definitely a physical player, but he revolutionized the center position, uh, I think, with his finesse. I think that it was unique to see a big man with so much finesse as he had. I remember him just making one of the toughest shots in the game, and that's the sky hook. He let you bump him, and he just took his time and took a step out and gave you a hook shot from 15 feet out. That's a hook shot. Unbelievable. Oh, my, what a hook shot. What a shot. They flipped it over his head, and the thing went right through. Seven seconds. Oh! Kareem with a big pressure shot. I've never seen anyone shoot, make two sky hooks in the game. I've never seen that in the NBA. And actually, if you take a sky hook and miss it, someone will think you're not being serious because of how difficult that shot is. I think the unique thing about his sky hook is that he brings his arm all the way out, and with his wrist, he flicks it. And uh, he doesn't cheat, where a lot of us just come up and try to guide the ball in. He really shoots the ball and follow throughs like a jump shot. Man, I used to have a pair almost like this in school. I wanted to be like Kareem. I wonder why I used to have them. Did he used to get hit in the eye or something like that? Those are the original ones. I used to wear those like 88 just to go to parties. These look like the ski goggles, like he could go and skiing after the game or something. Maybe I need to wear. I'm gonna help my shot a little bit more. Weber, with a lot of room to work, goes to the jump hook and rolls off the iron out the right side. Again, a tough roll. I define courage as recognizing when something needs to be done and doing it, even when there are easier choices. I think uh, what he's saying uh, here is that basically courage is defined at the hardest times of your life, not just when you're sitting on top, and that's what he respects the most. And his book uh, has a lot of positive stories and shares a lot of good things, and I think that's why we respect Kareem the man, not just for what he did on the basketball court, but for things like this. 
the one thing that I admire about Kareem the most is his championships and how he did it on each level. He was a high school legend and how he went for Coach Wooden and kept on winning. And then finally how he won with the Lakers. Playing 20 years, that means that he got every single inch of championship that he could out of his body. If I had that many championship rings, I don't know if my friends would like me that much because I have a lot to talk about. Chris and Kareem had similar stories in at least one respect. Both were number one draft picks who were traded early in their careers. And it worked out well for both of them. Abdul-Jabbar won five NBA titles in Los Angeles, while Weber sparked the resurgence of the Kings, leading them to two consecutive playoff appearances. We'll have much more on Kareem's professional and personal journey when we continue in just a moment. Kareem was one of the most beautiful players I've ever watched in my life. He had grace, he had style. He had the greatest shot that the game has ever seen. I have never seen a, an offensive weapon in any sport like that sky hook. It was one Mother's Day. Kareem got hot on me. He was making a hook shot. Right-handed, we knew he could shoot the hook shot. Well, this day, he makes four left-handed hook shots, then another right-handed hook shot, another hook shot, another one. It got so bad, man, I went home. I was laying in a bed. I was dreaming, oh, no, not another hook shot. Hook shot, no, no, not another one. Well, if it's any consolation to Daryl, there are many other players who had that same nightmare. For two decades, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar unleashed his sky hook on opposing centers. But it wasn't just a shot that made him so effective. It was his rare combination of size, skill, and agility. During his career with the Bucks and the Lakers, Kareem was a dominating force. And in 1984, he broke Wilt Chamberlain's all-time scoring record, fittingly, with his trademark shot. Magic right side, Kareem post up, they go to Kareem, Kareem backs in, hook shot, it's up, it's good, it's good, and the history of professional basketball, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. In his 20-year career, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar not only rewrote the NBA record book, he changed the way the game is played. Traditionally, a center was post up, robotic, catch it, pass, pick. Uh, and don't go outside of about eight feet. Kareem came in and he could shoot a sky hook from, from, from 10 feet out. Kareem was one of the most beautiful players I've ever watched in my life. He had grace, he had style. He had the greatest shot that the game has ever seen. I have never seen a, an offensive weapon in any sport like that sky hook. And that sky hook was just poetry in motion. See, when he get down real low, that means he's mad. He's going to score 30 or 40 tonight. Now, when he stands straight up, he might only give you 25. But if he down low, you're going to get 40. <laughs> it didn't matter if you had three guys on him. The whole team counted two points. So beautiful. Growing up as Lou Alcindor in Upper Manhattan, he literally stood head and shoulders over everyone else. As a high school star at Power Memorial in the early 60s, he learned the fine points of the game by studying Bill Russell and the Boston Celtics. I watched them play a good 20 or 30 times in Madison Square Garden. They used to play a lot of doubleheaders there at that time. And uh, he talked about professional seminars. They'd get the ball in transition like that when he'd block a shot and uh, beat you down the court and, and get a, a high percentage shot. That strategy is basically uh, John Wooden's strategy. Under legendary coach John Wooden at UCLA, Alcindor continued his basketball education, and he became the nation's top college player, leading his team to three consecutive national championships. This seven-foot, one-and-a-half-inch giant is largely responsible for the unbelievable records the Bruins have set in the last two seasons. He's agile for his size and a superstar in the making. The willingness to sacrifice individual talent for the, for the goal. I mean, that, that was what I learned in high school. That's what I learned from John Wood. Selected number one by Milwaukee in 1969, Alcindor quickly achieved NBA stardom. He led the Bucks to the title in 1971 in just their third season of existence. He was just so fluid. He was so unstoppable. He had the shot that, that nobody could deal with, the, the sky hook. Anytime he wanted to score, he could score. 
He had established himself as the game's best young player. Yet Alcindor, preferring solitude, shied away from the spotlight. He was different. You know, I mean, he, he brought a different mentality into the game as, as a person that, that, we had, that we had never seen before. He had a jazz man's mentality. He was very kind of aloof in the way that, and, and I think very much um, self-conscious about being an artist. Converting to Islam, he changed his name to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, meaning noble servant. The move further confounded many fans. I think that created some public misunderstanding of, of him uh, being uh, aloof. America is about individuals, and I just did not come from the same mold as most individuals in this, in this country. And uh, that was considered uh, in various ways at that time, sometimes with alarm. I remember uh, reading No Man is an Island, but Kareem gave it a shot. <laughs> that kind of summed me up in, in those days. After joining the Lakers, Kareem, like everyone else, was overwhelmed by the arrival of Magic Johnson in 1979. Ford sends it to Kareem. Sky hook up and good. Lakers win. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar has given the Los Angeles Lakers a victory. And Magic Johnson is out there celebrating like they just won the NCAA championship. Say, Buck, we got 81 more games. Quit choking me. <laughs> Led by Magic's infectious enthusiasm and Kareem's stoic pragmatism, the Lakers created Showtime, demolishing opponents with their vaunted fast break. Our whole goal was to run you into the ground. And the big fella be down court just waving it. OK, whenever y'all can't get a basket, then call me down. <laughs> I was a fossil from the, the earlier age, <laughs> playing with younger players, I guess. With Magic running the break and Kareem manning the middle, the Lakers won five NBA championships during the 1980s. And in the process, they helped Abdul-Jabbar find inner peace. It's funny, the, the last 10 years were, were much better than the first 10 years because uh, we were enjoying some professional success. That deflected a lot of criticism and in turn made it easier for me to smile and, uh, you know, fit in. <laughs> As his remarkable career began drawing to a close, Kareem finally received the appreciation of fans around the league who saluted him for all that he'd accomplished. It was wonderful. I, I, I really enjoyed it. I had no idea how many people's lives it, it touched until after I retired. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, to me, was the greatest player to ever play professional basketball. By the time he left the game in 1989, Kareem had compiled a staggering list of achievements. Among them, a record 19 All-Star selections, six MVP awards, and six NBA championships. He scored more points and blocked more shots than anyone in league history. But his talents weren't confined to the basketball court. No, no, no. When we come back, Kareem goes Hollywood. First, here's a look at what was happening during his rookie year, 1969. Welcome back, everyone, to Vintage NBA. When you look at Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's career, what stands out isn't just his greatness, but the fact that he sustained it for such a long period of time. And if you log on to NBA.com, we see that Kareem played 20 seasons, second only to Robert Parrish on the all-time list. He played from 1969 to 1989, and during his career, the times were a-changing in many different ways. For example, in those two decades, the United States had six presidents from Lyndon Johnson to George Bush. Music evolved from folk and rock in the 60s to the disco era of the 70s, to the beginnings of rap in the 80s. Of course, fashion styles changed from tie-dyed shirts and bell-bottoms to leisure suits and platform shoes, and then skinny ties. Then things came back full circle when bell-bottoms came back. Uh, fortunately, the leisure suits haven't. Kareem started in the time of hippies and left in the age of yuppies. 
The top-rated TV show in Kareem's rookie season was Rona Martin's Laugh-In. When he retired, it was Roseanne. The number one movie star in 1969 was Paul Newman, and by 89, it was Jack Nicholson. During that time, Kareem himself was learning the movie and entertainment business from both sides of the camera. He pursued his interests while spending most of his career near Hollywood, first at UCLA and later on with the Lakers. Kareem combined his interest in movies with his interest in martial arts when he co-starred with karate expert Bruce Lee in the action flick Game of Death. But everyone seemed to get a kick out of his role as a co-pilot in the 1979 comedy Airplane. Kareem then landed in a different kind of role when he began posing questions to other athletes as a TV sports reporter. Moving to the other side of the camera, he founded his own production company, where one of his first films dealt with the civil rights movement of the 1960s and starred James Earl Jones. I'm very happy that Kareem has found a way to take all that energy and also to bring his, his um, ethnic awareness and his, uh, his, his uh, American awareness uh, to help deal with the stories that are un unsung. For Kareem, he found the role of producer as exciting as manning the pivot. Well, each has its challenges, and uh, I think each has uh, its own special rewards. Uh, a job well done, though, is a, a kind of universal satisfaction. Long a student of history, Kareem devoted several of his film projects to historical subjects, including a film on an all-black army battalion in World War II. He also wrote a book called Black Profiles and Courage, focusing on the contributions of African Americans. Kareem made plenty of history himself during his playing days, including the day in 1972 when he played in one of the NBA's most famous regular season games. And you'll see it when we come back. Stay with us. Back in 1972, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and his Milwaukee Bucks were the defending NBA champs. But the Lakers were the talk of the league, and the entire sports world for that matter. Los Angeles won 33 consecutive games, a pro sports record. And they took their streak into Milwaukee in what was billed as the dream game. It's the subject of this week's Airwave Archive. The date, January 9th, 1972. The place, Milwaukee Arena. And here's the call from Keith Jackson and Bill Russell. Our officials for this afternoon's ball game, two of the best in the business, Richie Powers and Mendy Rudolph. The tip, and Milwaukee controls it, the Bucks are wearing white. Number 14 is John McLaughlin, number one is Oscar Robertson, number 10 is Bobby Dandridge, number 18 is Curtis Perry. Lou Alcindor, as he was known last year, his official name now is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Underneath the is good. So Jim McMillan comes up for it as Milwaukee takes the ball. Gail Goodrich, number 25 for the Lakers in blue. John McLaughlin on him. Gail spins and shoots and misses. An air ball cleared by Dandridge of Milwaukee. The Bucks getting the first points and they have the ball now as Oscar brings it down. It is Jerry West. He missed the shot. The tip is good. And Jabbar will get credit for the basket and Milwaukee jumps to a 4-0 lead. Goodrich has it. Jerry West is number 44. Happy Hairston, number 52 in blue. Happy shot from outside. Comes off. Chamberlain for the tip. And Javar comes down with it. And here come the Bucks leading 4 to nothing in the opening minute of play. McLaughlin with a three-inch advantage in height over Gail Goodrich. It's Jerry West now on Dandridge. As Dandridge works off the baseline. Misses badly. Inside. They come out with it. And right over here to us. So it's a turnover on Los Angeles, and he gets a grin from Oscar. It could be the Lakers are a little tight. They have won 33 consecutive games. This is the first time they have played here this season. Here is Abdul Jabbar inside against Chamberlain. He got it. It is 6 0 Milwaukee in the first minute and a half. Oscar after Jerry. McMillan over Dandridge. Jimmy McMillan gets Los Angeles first points of the afternoon. It is 6-2, and they try to break it with McLaughlin. Goodrich spoils it. Obviously trying to go to McLaughlin, who has the height advantage over 
Gail Goodrich, but that time Stumpy read it and broke it up. It is McMillan on Dandridge. Jabbar and Chamberlain. He's at two in a row over Wilkes. He has a total of six points. And it's 8-2 Milwaukee. They try to go inside to Abdul Jabbar. Chamberlain gets the ball. Nice play, but he is forced out of bounds, and the Lakers will keep it. No, he will not. It'll go to Milwaukee. In the collision of the big men, Wilk went over the line, and the judgment of Richie Powers, who was right there, the ball should go to the Bucks, and they have it. Here's Jabbar again, working against Wilk that time. Wilk got a piece of him and fouled him. I think here we have the in the battle of the big man already, Bill. We have Abdul Jabbar trying to get the emotional edge early. Yes, uh, he's trying to establish position, so to speak. Uh, he's going taking it straight to Wilt, uh, maybe to try to discourage him and get him down. Uh, I think this is probably a good strategy, since it seems to be working. So it's pretty good. So that um, I guess he's trying to get psychological edge early in the game. He misses the second free throw. It is 9-2 Milwaukee. We have nine and a half minutes to go in the first period. Gail Goodrich. That's Jerry West. In the corner, it's McMillan. And it comes out. The rebound by Hairston. That's a mistake on uh, on Curtis Perry there. Not straight out happy Harrison. You got that's what happens to young guys. They forget sometimes. They don't concentrate as much as they have to. The Bucks by five. Curtis Perry. It's Oscar out of the corner. Wilt Chamberlain lost the rebound to Perry. Dandridge. Perry loses to Goodrich. And Gale is out of there with it. Hairston is open. Goes to McMillan. His favorite shot. Missed it. Hairston. Goodrich over McLaughlin. So Gail Goodrich scores. He's averaging better than 26 per game. Eight and a half minutes to go. First quarter. It's nine to six, Milwaukee. Abdul Jabbar against Chamberlain. Wilk took it away from him. Jerry West is fouled. He'll shoot two. Foul on McLaughlin. John McLaughlin making the switch, trying to pick him up as he started his drive. The Lakers had a four on three, and West saw a hole, drove through it, foul, shoots two. Season average, you see. Milwaukee, four out of seven from the field. Los Angeles, three out of eight. Jerry at the line makes it a 9-7 ball game. Bucks lead by two. So Jerry West of West Virginia. Holds the Lakers within a single point here in the first quarter. There is not a vacant seat in the building. Curtis Perry. McLaughlin is open. That's a mistake that Goodrich can't do. He couldn't steal the ball from Jabbar anyway, and he left his man wide open, so he's got to stick with his man rather than going in a position where he's not going to really do anything. Chamberlain slam dunk. That was a great pass by Goodrich. That's what you got to do against both these guys. You got to penetrate and pass off. And we've got a timeout with 7.51 to go in the first quarter here at the Milwaukee Arena with our score, the Bucks 11, the Lakers 10. With their 33-game winning streak, the Lakers destroyed the previous record of 20 set by the Bucks one season earlier. Now, what made the streak even more impressive is that 16 of L.A.'s victories came on the road. And it may be one of the NBA's most unbreakable records because no team has come close to it since. But the streak was on the line in Milwaukee. And speaking of streaking, here's something to think about as we head to break. <laughs> We all know that Wilt Chamberlain's greatest rival was Bill Russell, but perhaps his toughest matchup was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. When Kareem entered the league, Wilt said it was the first time he actually needed help in guarding an opponent. 
and it was especially tough in January of 72, as Wilt was in the twilight of his career while Kareem was in his prime. With the two big men going head to head, the Bucks lead by seven as we pick up the action in the third quarter. Jerry West on Oscar. Dandridge finally gets outside to help. McLaughlin, three inches taller than Gail Goodrich, gives it to Dandridge, who got away from McMillan, missed the shot. Slapped out. Goodrich gets it to McMillan. But the fast break is spoiled. Here's Jerry West, three, 20 foo footer, good. Basket by Jerry West. It's a five point Milwaukee lead. Long pass down to Jabbar, who gets loose for his hook. Now, Keith, he didn't fool around that ball at all. He went for the hoop right away. And when he's doing that, he can shoot. He can really shoot. That's, that's the kind of shots he wants to get. He has 21 points. Will Chamberlain with four fouls. Didn't want to commit himself. Didn't want to get in trouble. He's never fouled out of a game, but he's got four right now. Here's McMillan missing. Forced the shot. Chamberlain right there for the rebound. Right time, right away. Now, uh, Kareem had gone out then, as he should have. And it's a seven point Milwaukee lead with eight and a half minutes to go, third quarter. The Lakers with a 33 game win streak. Here's Hairston. And the foul. Harvey took it up, trying to slam it through there. Oh, uh, Curtis Curry Curtis was right there Perry. and got too much Curry. of it. It was almost a block. At the line, F. Hairston. But not quite. Hairston shooting two. Happy with 13 rebounds and eight points. Makes the first one. 8.25 to go third quarter. Harrison's second shot. A five point Milwaukee lead. 61, Lakers 56. Robertson and West. Oscar shoots. Oh. Nothing to do with that. Just call it cry for help. Help. That's right. Just yell. Yeah. Lean back and holler as loud as you can. Jerry West trying to come back. He's fouled by Dandridge. Here it is. Did Dandridge come across? Third personal. There, Dandridge comes across, hooks him on the arm. Jerry West at the line for the Lakers. Jerry, 11 points, three out of eight from the field, five out of six from the line, six out of seven as he makes it. One free throw. In it goes for Jabbar. Chamberlain takes it away. Leaves it for Goodrich. Ball is slapped loose, right to West. Jerry takes it all away. No basket. No basket. No basket. He's pointing at Happy Hairston for a foul, blocking prior to the shot. Offensive foul, Hairston. Third personal. Oscar had a hand jammed, but shaking it off. You know, when you commit those kind of fouls, you want to go someplace and hide. <laughs> a six point Milwaukee lead. McLaughlin, good fake, gets Goodrich up. Jabbar follows the rebound. Uh, more or less, look what I found in school. Now that was a good move by Jabbar. It gave, him the, it gave him a little motion so he couldn't get set. Steve Wilson. 25 points now for Kareem. The Lakers are down by eight. Chamberlain gives it to Hairston. Jabbar, clean block. Beautiful play by Kareem Jabbar. Curtis Perry missed the shot. Loose ball. It's against Perry. Let's go back and look at the block. Loose ball foul. Now Kareem went, Perry. moved for earlier than he usually does. That's why he was able to get it. See, he has to go out first. That was his fourth blocked shot. And Bill Sherman, coach of the Lakers, disturbed the way things are going in the ball game. Uh, Chris, that foul on Curt uh, Curtis Perry, you expect that. When a guy misses a layup, almost, unless he's an old pro and really thinks about it, he'll commit a foul almost right away because he's trying to make up for it right away. Right. And you've got to control yourself. If you don't, you get in foul trouble. That's right. Jim McMillan, backcourt foul, fifth team foul, and McMillan shooting two. John Block, number 34. You see him there, his return to the lineup. He had 11 big points in the first half. It's 65-59, a six-point lead for Milwaukee with 6.55 to go in the third quarter. Here's Block now with Hairston coming out to check him. In it goes to Jabbar. 
Silky move. He's five for five in the field in the third quarter. You notice he's not fooling around the ball as much now, kid. He's not dribbling and turning his back and, and, and jockeying for position. He's just taking the ball and shooting it. Plus, Wilt has four fouls, so he cannot afford to be as aggressive as he might ordinarily be. And a brilliant effort by Jim McMillan. So 6.20 to go in the third quarter. Oscar comes down with the ball, calls the signal, sends block to the other side of the court. He wants to work it. Goes inside the Jabbar. Now it's the block to uh, McLaughlin. Here's Oscar, short. Wilt the rebound. Knocked loose and out of bounds. Los Angeles will keep it. Here comes Wally Jones into the lineup, replacing John McLaughlin for Milwaukee. Sixty-seven to sixty-one. Six minutes to go in the third quarter. We move inside six now as Jerry West comes down. Drives against block. No place to go with it. Goodrich has had his troubles with Wally Jones. Well, he's done a pretty good job against Gale when he's been in there, and he's in there right now. Here's Gale loose for a shot. And a great assist by Jerry West. He penetrated, forced him to come to him, and set Gale up. See, Wally dropped off again to try to help out. You can't do that. You've got to stay with your own man, especially with, the, with a good impression as West is. You've got to stay with your own man, no matter where he goes. Here's Jones trying to retaliate against Goodrich and not able to do it. Hairston way up. Who's by, that foul's on Block. John Block. And that is four personals on Block. And the fifth, we're now in the penalty situation. And we've got 5.21 to go in the third quarter. And it's right now a four-point lead for the Milwaukee Bucks over the Los Angeles Lakers at 67 to 63. So the Bucks are making a strong bid to stop the Lakers' winning streak at 33. Actually, Wilt claimed he wasn't all that impressed because he once played for the Harlem Globetrotters, who won 400 games in a row, all of them on the road. But the Lakers streak was a little bit more legit, and it lasted for more than two months. Jerry West said the team was on one of those rolls where they could do no wrong. Every night it was something different. It was a, uh, either a, a good defensive play or just an incredible offensive night. And all of a sudden we get to 15, and well, I think we have 17 or 18, at the, and then all of a sudden we're at 21. And after that, it really got easy. Cream led the charge. He stepped up. Uh, his game really, really improved. It had to improve. Uh, he started to play just you know, a lot of better basketball players, a lot of bigger players who were almost just as tall and, and big as he was, who understood the game as well, but, but they couldn't stop Kareem off the pivot. Oscar finally won his first NBA title when he teamed up with Kareem on the 71 Bucks. Their challenge now is trying to stop the red-hot Lakers and end the longest winning streak in sports history. Milwaukee has been in control most of the way, and they still have a seven-point lead as we head back to the action for the start of the fourth quarter. The Los Angeles Lakers, 33-game win streak on the line as we go to the final 12 minutes, and Jerry West comes out of there with it. It's been a great ball game to this point, and Jim McMillan Basket hits the first bucket Jim of the final McMillan. quarter. And the Bucks are leading by five. As Wally Jones, Lucius Allen, Bobby Dandridge, Curtis Perry, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar take the floor for the Bucks. Jerry West is guarding Lucius Allen. Glenn Robinson, Jim McMillan, Wilt Chamberlain. Good play as McMillan sets it up for Glenn Robinson. And he breaks away to score it. And now the Lakers are down by only three. Into Abdul-Jabbar for a hook. He missed it. The high rebound. And a whistle and a foul. Curtis, Curtis Perry, I thought, 18. So Curtis Perry now with five personal fouls. John Block is on the bench for the Bucks with five personal fouls. Will Chamberlain has four. Bobby Dandridge, four. Jerry West shot two flat. Rebound Perry for the Bucks. Toby Kimball has not been in the game. He represents size and strength if they need to go to him. Very few substitutions actually at the front line positions. Here is the shot up and off, and Jerry West comes out of it. It's a three on two. A pass for McMillan, and it gets away. So a turnover for Los Angeles, and that's 20. 20 turnovers. 
Oscar Robertson is back in the lineup for Milwaukee with Lucius Allen in the backcourt. Here comes John Block back into the ball game for the Bucks. So he joins Perry and Jabbar on the front line. I just ran down the fouls for you. So here we go with 10.45 to go. You pretty well know where we are. Three-point Milwaukee lead. Jabbar against Chamberlain. Inside. Lucius Allen sneaking in. You notice McMillan came out trying to help the question. Right now, uh, when McMillan's only a double team in Jabbar, that means his man is free, so you gotta look for the loose man. McMillan. Basket by Jim. And it's now a three-point lead again for the Bucks. It has been said that this man with the ball, Oscar Robertson, is the most stabilizing influence in basketball. We'll see. John Gluck. Boy, I'll tell you, he's torn a hole in the Lakers today. He's got 15 points. And Allen almost stole the ball. McMillan comes back to help now as the Bucks put on the pressure in the backcourt. Jerry West brings it up. 9.55. Jerry's trying to get by Oscar. He does. He hooks it back. Intended for Chamberlain. Gets away. Hairston tries to save it and can't do it. Well, that's twice now. The Lakers have come down here in the opening moments of the fourth quarter and turned it over. I think at this point, the, the Bucks are getting better shots than the Lakers are. Although the Lakers are right in here and making the shots, they're, they're not the shots that they would, I think they would like to get. Oscar feeds it in to Curtis Perry. He gets the bucket. Milwaukee 17 out of 29 from the field in the second half. Wow. That was Perry's first point. Here's Glenn Robinson in traffic. Gets it up. Oh, it's good. Basket counts. He was fouled. Take a look at it. And the foul is on Abdul Jabbar. That is his third personal foul. Glenn got it up. It danced around a little, but fell the right way. And he makes a three-point play. Milwaukee leading by four. 9-10 to go in the ball game. Very much a major league contest, as we suggested at the outset. Jabbar, double team, slapped loose as Robinson came around the blind side. That's dangerous stuff Robinson's doing. He's leaving the man free. If Jabbar can keep that ball up over his head, he can hit the free, the free man pretty easy. Lucius Allen. Goes to Kareem. Lucius. Block with it. Look out for this man. He's been all day. He has 17 points. And it's a six-point Milwaukee lead. And a sign of experience in that he has five fouls. He's playing pretty much the same way he was playing before. And you have, you have to know what you're doing when you do that. Robinson is open. He hit it. Lucius Allen got caught in traffic and took a whack on the side of the head, and Glenn Robinson got loose for his 13th point. They're making those shots, Keith, but those, those are not necessarily good percentage shots that they're making, that the Lakers are making. They're, they're pretty long shots. Here's Allen. Goal tending, called against Chamberlain. Or is it McMillan? Allen, 7 out of 10. 94, 88, 810 to play in a game. The Lakers 33 game win streak right on the line. Jerry hit, it gets away with it. Here's Glenn Robinson outside with a howitzer that's good. Maybe those other shots they want to take. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the other night in Atlanta, the Hawks were very much in it Friday night. Flynn came out to start the second half of that ball game for the Lakers and hit four in a row and that quick it was all over. So they need some of the outside firepower. He's six out of 11 from the field. Oscar comes right back down. This time he cannot retaliate with the points. And it is off the hands of Curtis Perry out of bounds. Here comes Gail Goodrich back and Flynn Robinson leaves for Los Angeles. So the question keeps running through everybody's mind. Is this where the Lakers streak stops? So I'll tell you, if you've got to lose a streak, it's not a bad place to lose it. Here's the shot by Goodrich. Chamberlain inside has the ball but has to come out with it. Here's Jerry West on the baseline. Here's Hairston, has it knocked out of his hands, out of bounds, L.A. will keep it. A four-point Milwaukee lead with 7.20 to go in the ballgame. 
94-90. Harrison. He's working against Block. Offensive foul, Harrison. Nice call, ref. <laughs> that that was, wasn't too obvious. Uh, Happy Harrison has four personal fouls. 7 10 to play in the ball game. Bucks up by four. Lucius Allen. Happy Harrison the rebound. Double handful of them. Jerry West. Tip. Chamberlain. Basket by Chamberlain. Two point Milwaukee lead. 94, 94. 6.40 to play. Oscar back to Jabbar. Slammed it. 33 points for Abdul Jabbar. Goodrich. Oh, halfway down. Came out. John Block slows it down. Time call by the Milwaukee Bucks. Six minutes, 23 seconds to play in the ball game here at Milwaukee Arena. Our score, Bucks 96, Los Angeles Lakers 92. The Bucks pulled away to win that game 120 to 104, snapping the Lakers streak. And the star was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who finished with 39 points and 20 rebounds. L.A. did go on to win the title that season, and it was just three years later that Kareem was traded to the Lakers, where he helped them build a dynasty in the 80s. His legacy, of course, was the Skyhook. And we'll look at some of the game's other hookshot artists when we come back. We're at about 152nd Street and Amsterdam Avenue in Manhattan. And uh, this is where I first really started playing competitive basketball with the guys in the neighborhood. People waiting to play would, would shoot on this, this basket here and uh, kick the breeze around. The main goings on, though, was on the full court. We'd run up and down this full court. It was very important to look good out here in front of all the folks, and uh, this was just our little uh, place where we, we competed. You know, it's too bad Kareem couldn't have had a nicer day to visit his old playground instead of walking in the rain like that. But it did bring back memories of when he first started raining skyhooks on opponents. He actually invented the shot back in fourth grade. Kareem found it was the only way he could get off a shot without having the ball slammed back in his face. It's kind of hard to believe, isn't it? It became his greatest weapon, but he wasn't the only player with a deadly hook shot. From the early days of the NBA, there was George Mikan, who even had the Kareem-like goggles. The Minneapolis Lakers star had an unstoppable hook shot, and making him even more effective was that he could hit it with either hand. Another pioneer was Neil Johnston, who unleashed his sweeping hook back in the 50s. Neil used the shot to lead the league in scoring three consecutive seasons while leading the Philadelphia Warriors to the 1956 title. In the 70s, Bob Lanier brought his left-handed hook to the NBA. It helped make him one of the game's best centers as he averaged 20 points and 10 rebounds a game during his career with the Pistons and the Bucks. There was 7'2 Artis Gilmore, who may have been best known as a shot blocker. But Artis had plenty of offense, including the hook that helped him shoot 60% from the field during his career, the highest percentage in NBA history. Magic Johnson, I know, was a point guard, but he took notes from Kareem on the skyhook and mastered his own version, which he called the junior skyhook. And Magic used it to beat the Celtics in game four of the 87 finals, sending the Lakers on their way to the title. There's another version of the shot, the jump hook, and one player who has it down pat, Toronto's Kevin Willis. Whether it's the hook or a different kind of shot, every player has their own go-to move. I think Shaq jump hook is just becoming un it's like unstoppable now because he's so big and then you know he's turning down and he's facing you up and then he's spinning. He's doing a lot of other things besides overpowering you now. I think right now, I think I have to say Carl Malone in his fadeaway. I think that he, you know, he has a shot right now that he gets it. He has the ability to, to fade away and make that shot pretty much every time. And every time he shoots it, you say, well, he can't make that one, and he keeps on making it. To the fadeaway. Tim Duncan's shot off of the glass is probably his signature move and probably the most consistent shot that you see in the NBA right now. There goes Tim Duncan looking at Ty's career high. He's got 40. He's got 42! 
He is unstoppable. And that's old school. Well, if you like Tim Duncan's old school bank shot like I do or any other trademark shot, you can tell us about it by logging on to NBA.com and checking out Vintage NBA in the history section. You can also give us your thoughts on Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and read about one of his greatest games, the day an aging Kareem found his fountain of youth in the 1985 NBA Finals. We'll be right back. Of Kareem Abdul Jabbar's stature, one simple retirement ceremony wouldn't do him justice. So during his final season, Kareem was honored in every NBA arena. His Laker teammates presented him with a rocking chair, and fans around the league had a chance to say goodbye to the master of the skyhook. The shot was his signature, and he used it to write his own indelible chapter in NBA history. That's it for this edition of Vintage NBA. So glad you could be with us. I'm Robin Roberts, and we'll look for you again next time. Take care. It may be the last time we shake hands. It may be the last time we make plans. But whatever happens, thank you from the bottom of my heart.